Hi, I'm Chip Rogers, and welcome to the AHOA Educational Experience. This week, my guests, first, Raj Goyle, a former Kansas State representative, big, big friend of AHOA for many years. Absolutely. And we're glad you're here with us. Thanks for having and Lori Kalani, who is a senior counsel for Oric, Harrington, and Sutcliffe. And Lori, thank you for being with us today. My pleasure. You know, in today's world, we have 24-hour news stations that are dedicated solely to what's going on in the world of politics, what's happening in Washington, D.C., what's happening around the states. You know, I go back to, uh, as kids, we're probably all close to the same age, we used to have those Saturday morning TV shows that told us how a bill became a law. Mm -hmm. It was the <laughs> Schoolhouse Rock, right, yeah, if I recall. Right. Uh, Schoolhouse Rock, to my knowledge, doesn't exist. I'm not sure Saturday morning cartoons exist anymore. <laughs> but the world of politics now, which was used to be relegated to the 6 o'clock evening news with, with Walter Conkite, is now with us 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And uh, we've almost made uh, rock stars out of, out of politicians in some way. Um, but the fact of the matter is, unfortunately, a lot of people don't know this process. They know the players, they see them on TV, but they don't really understand what is all this about. How do laws get made in, in, our, in our local areas, in our state, and in our country? Uh, and that's what I'd like to, to start with, just really the basics of, you know, Raj, you served in the State House of Representatives in Kansas. Uh, explain to us, you know, how do you go from having this idea to actually turning it into something that's a law? Sure. Well, first, thanks a lot for having me. And uh, I should say uh, I have an 18-month-old daughter, so I can certify <laughs> Saturday morning cartoons exist. Uh, Nickelodeon's doing very well. Right. Uh, uh, but, you know, the legislative process in many ways uh, I found in my four years in the legislature to be both more simple and more complex than, than many people would think. Uh, it's a lot more simple, especially at the state legislative level, to get bills passed and to get them introduced. And so uh, to answer your question directly, uh, when a legislator has an idea, he or she can have a bill written, uh, have it authored, introduce that bill, and uh, have it go through the committee process, have it passed. Uh, both chambers, uh, and then uh, and then if a, a bill is presented to the governor, he or she signs it. And so uh, along the way, of course, is the standard uh, building blocks of politics, marshalling support of your fellow legislators uh, if you're a legislator who's championing the bill, or if you're an outside group who wants that bill passed, getting support uh, within the legislature and from the outside community to support that idea. And Lori, you know, at, at the state level, we have... Uh as Raj pointed out, I mean, it's a fairly simple process, and I guess textbook-wise, it's probably that same process at the federal level, but it's far more complicated, and it takes a lot longer. I know we can actually pass a bill in the state house of representatives and, and through the Senate and to the governor and do it all in one yeah, one part-time session. Yeah, right. session. But in Washington, I, I heard recently the average law takes seven years wow. to, right. to to actually go from start to finish, and why is that so difficult? <laughs> I've, I've heard the same number seven years, and I think every year, just to give you some context, uh, it, I know in the 109th Congress, I believe 10,700 bills or, or thereabouts were introduced, and about 1,700 of them became law. And so it's a very long, uh, drawn-out process. I think, one, because the committees are larger, two, because you don't just typically have uh, one legislator who sponsors a bill. It's typically a lot of work that goes behind that where there's draft bills and, and marshalling the support of your colleagues may take years because that colleague is not going to sign on until they've talked to all of the people on both sides. So it's just a longer process. The committees are larger. The subcommittees often have to hear the bills first. And, and so the process is just sort of double for everything that's going on in the state house. And, and I've had experience in both the federal and state arena and I I see a huge difference in, in, in the process and the and the timing. You know, it, it seemed I have constituents that will come to me and I'm sure you had constituents that would come to you and you had friends that would come to you and they'd say, Well here's a good idea for a law and the, the expectation is that if it's a good idea, it should happen like overnight. That just this <laughs> is and, and in a way, um, it's probably good that our system is set up that even the best of ideas must go through a fairly arduous process and 
I mean, you, you saw that even at the state at the state level. You just can't take an idea and turn it into a law like that. No, there's uh, you know one thing that uh, former governor of Kansas uh, taught me that I'll never forget is that it's a lot easier to kill something than it is uh, <laughs> to get it passed, and I think we all right. can relate to that. That uh, saying no in the legislative process, uh, it's a lot easier for those people rather than promoting an idea and overcoming the many objections that can happen. And uh, as you mentioned, the process is sometimes a very healthy one where there's a good idea, uh, where there's a legislative proposal, and uh, as as it as it continues in the legislative process. Process, people will raise uh, questions or concerns and then those get addressed and the bill changes accordingly and so uh, when the process is working at it at its uh, in its best way uh, an idea germinates and goes through a process becomes better and if it can marshal a majority of support becomes a law it, and you, you highlighted something there that I think sometimes gets lost on the casual observer of politics and that is that you don't essentially start with an idea and expect that whatever that idea was from day one is what the governor or the president mm -hmm. or, the, or the mayor of the city or whomever is going to validate it as a new law or ordinance. That there is this process, what we call the amendment process, and that can dramatically change from where you start to where you end. Lori, talk about amendment process and why that is so important. So the amendment, so once a bill gets to the committee level and the committee has reported that out, there's, there's an amendment process and that would vary depending on the state and, it's, and there's certainly a different, a slightly different process at the federal level. But in some cases I've seen bills become amended with an entirely new bill. <laughs> So it really depends on the state rules and whether or not an amendment can be germane to that bill or whether it's, it's more broad and can, and like I said, can, you can have a, a new bill entirely replace a bill that was introduced. So quite often those good ideas are, are completely different ideas by the time the bill is passed into law. And you, you mentioned there were, you said 10,000 uh, some odd bills introduced in, in the federal Congress. One way that some of the states handle this is to say, you can only introduce a certain number of bills. Now, in, in my home state of Georgia, we're, we're not limited at all from, we can introduce 100 bills if we'd like. What about Kansas? Well, Kansas uh, has no limit uh, per se on the number of bills that uh, a legislator or that the legislature can hear. However, there are time deadlines built into the schedule, and, and right. certainly as a majority leader, <laughs> you're in charge of that calendar, and uh, and uh, I, I commend you for getting that done because that's very difficult work. Uh, what I like to describe the legislative process is, um, and the deadlines are like a filter, uh, and so that at the beginning of the session in Topeka, um, there could be count number of bills, there's no limit, but each week that goes by in a limited session of about 13 to 14 weeks uh, is like a filter so that the first deadline comes and you're trying to cut people off from uh, there's only certain bills that can be introduced after that time and then there's another deadline that comes. But as you well know, uh, in legislative processes, uh, a majority can do anything. And so <laughs> even though a deadline may have passed, um, you know, it can be the end of the session and, um, and rules are there, but uh, a, a majority vote can change those rules to make sure that that right. bill gets done if that's what the majority wants to do. Majority, majority <laughs> yeah. votes for a new rule. Yes, exactly, <laughs> right. Majority creates the new rule. Yeah. That's right. 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 But, you know, if you think about it, while there may be some cases where um, a legislator may introduce 10, 12, 14 bills, the reality is, is if it's a meaningful bill, it's very difficult to pass more than one in a session. I mean, it, this is not easy work to get a bill through the process. No, it's a lot of work. And, and there's a lot of work on the back end that people don't realize has to happen. Uh, there's, there's sort of pricing the bill and looking at what the, what the cost implications to the state will be and, and having a report from other agencies within the state that would be affected by that bill. And to your point about uh, introducing bills, I work all over the country with, an, uh, with every state legislature and I see in some states they actually limit the legislators to 12 bills or 8 bills. It, you know, If you're a legislator without a committee, without being the chair of a committee, you're limited just to try to manage that and then use as well the, gu the date, the deadlines and, and the calendar to try to filter out the rest of them. We need to take a quick time out. Uh, when we come back, we're going to continue our discussion on the legislative process and how it works and what it means to you. We'll be back right after this. And welcome back to the AHOA Educational Experience. I'm Chip Rogers, and with me this week is both Raj Goyal and Lori Kalani. And thank you again for being with us today. We, we spoke in the first segment, really, the, the, how a bill becomes a law or some of the aspects of, of how legislation works. 
And you know, when again, when you watch the Schoolhouse Rock or you look in your textbook, you can read this. You know, you can read. I know when I speak to school children, I say, you've got to go to legislative council and get the bill drawn up, and then it has to be introduced and it goes to committee. And you can read that part. The part you don't read about is the human interaction in all of this. Because while, again, it may be a great bill, maybe the greatest idea ever, uh, as we say in the South, but, you know, the best thing since sliced bread. <laughs> um, if you don't have the relationships in this process, it becomes very, very difficult. If you can't make friends, even with people on the other side of the aisle, you're going to have a difficult time passing legislation. You've been there and done that. Explain the, the human interaction part. Sure. Uh, I think it's a great point, and it really is something that I think uh, a, a casual observers of the system uh, underappreciate, just how important human relationships and contacts are to get something done. And so, um, you know, I was a Democrat and uh, when we were in the minority in the House and the Senate in Topeka, and uh, yet we had influence because we had a collegial spirit uh, in Topeka. And one of the things I think that is a stark contrast to Washington, D.C., is just how ideological and partisan that the Beltway has become. Whereas I think in state legislatures, there is uh, perhaps more of a focus, um, not all the time, but on the content of an idea and on getting something done for your constituents. And so so uh, relationships are everything. Um, and so we had examples where, you know, there in, in Washington these days, it seems like if you're a member of the minority, uh, you might as well not even introduce an idea because it's not going to get passed. Well, that's not the case, at least in my four years in the legislature. And so, uh, you know, if there's a committee chairperson who, uh, who you have the trust of and is going to say, Representative Goyle has done his homework on this bill, I trust him, I'm going to have this bill, I'm going to move it along, I'm going to have a hearing. Uh, and if you don't have that trust, you can find life in the legislature to be pretty lonely pretty quickly. Yeah. Laura, you, you've seen this from both the state perspective and the federal perspective, and, and you've seen more states than we have. I mean, I've seen my state, you've seen yeah, your right. state, you've seen a lot of states. Yeah. Um, is that fairly common? Because I know in Georgia it's very similar to Kansas. We, you know, yes, it's, there are Democrats and Republicans, but oftentimes in our state, because we're an interesting mix where we have one large city that's over half the state's population, our battles are more mm -hmm. urban versus rural. Right. Um, I mean, speak to that a little bit about the, maybe the differences you see from the states compared to the federal government as it, as it pertains to how this political machine works. I definitely think it's less partisan in the states. I mean, we have a system where people run as a Democrat or a Republican or an independent, but when, when the rubber hits the road, uh, so to speak, the, the members of the legislatures get it together and they get the work done, more so than we see in the federal, at the federal level. Uh, you're absolutely right, if, if, you're a, if you're a minority in, at the federal level, you may as well pack it up and take it <laughs> home today for, you know, for a lot of issues. It's just, mm -hmm. it's just a, a fight of the wills. So I think that uh, the relationships definitely at the state level matter, and not only amongst the legislators themselves, but amongst the outside, the business community, the constituents. I, I think that maybe it's because they're in the state all, all week long and they're not in D.C. Mm -hmm. as opposed to the federal legislators. They're, they seem more connected with their constituents and, and there's an open dialogue there to help educate them. You know, one of the, uh, the, the things that I think sometimes gets lost in, in how laws are made and how they're actually implemented and enforced is sometimes a, a non-understanding of the division of powers. We, we've been talking a lot about the legislative branch, but the executive branch, and in some cases even the judicial branch, has the ability to, uh, with the judicial branch, interpret law in a certain way, uh, and with the executive branch, I mean, it is their role to actually enforce the law. So uh, it's not just the legislators or the legislatures uh, that are impacting the laws that we live by. I mean, there are other branches of government that have a big impact. Absolutely, and in fact, uh, you know, you mentioned the executive branch. Uh, I certainly didn't appreciate until I served in the legislature the role of agencies. Uh, in the legislative process. Uh, I served on the tax committee and I was at 9 a.m. every morning uh, doing tax law. So, you know, <laughs> something we all jumped in, uh, you know, out of bed to get to. Uh, although, uh, jokes aside, it was actually a very, uh, um, it, was, it was probably my favorite committee in the legislature. We did good work. It was nonpartisan. Uh, but we worked very closely with the revenue department uh, um, of, the, of the state of Kansas to make sure that uh, we had information from them, not taking the lead from the revenue department. Sometimes they had 
had bills that they wanted to get introduced that some people forget that uh, you know the governor and the administration introduce a lot right. of legislation not just legislators or outside uh, uh, parties uh, but we worked with the revenue department to make sure that we understood an issue or to get cost estimates like you were mentioning and so um, I think that it's very important that uh, people do understand that the executive branch uh, is a very important part of the legislative process and getting things done and of course the judicial branch is vital um, right. now their work is uh, very distinct uh, for obvious reasons uh, legal and ethical and, and uh, uh, from the legislative process but on issues from school finance to taxes uh, to really you name it uh, we always in the legislature were thinking about uh, whether or not this would uh, if something was a uh, uh, questionable or there was a concern of well, how would the courts treat this and what would the courts do uh, uh, with this piece of legislation and that was an important concern to keep in mind. And Lori, I know you do a lot of work with attorneys general around the, the country. I mean, what role do these attorneys general play in this whole lawmaking process? Well, certainly as the chief law enforcers of the state, they have an interest in law enforcement. So uh, above and beyond, above, above all, they're concerned about making sure that there's legislation that, that can help them further those goals. So I know they work very closely with the legislature, oftentimes having one or two full-time employees who just interface on a regular basis to make sure that they're, they've got this open communication both ways. I sort of think of the three branches as a triangle on a continuum mm -hmm. with the executive branch at the top and, and the two corners being the other two branches and, and just this free flow of, of information because as you said we often see the judicial branch looking at things and saying or the legislature mm -hmm. saying how, how is this going to withstand the scrutiny of the court system and so uh, it's, it's a very close relationship. Final question for this segment I want both of you to touch on it for just a moment. We started the show and I, I referenced the fact that we live in a time where there's 24-hour news that's really dedicated to the, almost the political process, or at least politics in general. Um, and some would say that's a good thing, some would say that's a bad thing. Mm -hmm. How has it impacted um, the, the process of, of making laws? I mean, for example, uh, the health care reform uh, probably, I guess in my political time, received more scrutiny mm -hmm. at the cable news network level <laughs> uh, than than anything else I've seen. How has that impacted the process? Well, I certainly agree about the health care reform debate. I'll never forget when a constituent asked me about if the Senate Finance Committee had passed a bill and I <laughs> was surprised that uh, people knew there was a Senate <laughs> Finance Committee up in Washington and so uh, the role of the media and blogs and the internet uh, has obviously transformed politics and and I, I for one personally think that uh, more transparency is always a good thing uh, and so yes there is a, a feeling in legislatures that perhaps without all this sunlight, uh, maybe more deal making could happen, there could be more studied consideration of issues. Uh, at the same time, uh, I think it's uh, the more that we have the legislative process and the political process open, transparent, let the public uh, give their input, uh, and let all sides give their input, I think only benefits the process. But uh, in terms of the actual day to day, it has no doubt changed things. People realize that a, um, a committee vote uh, can be on the front page of the newspaper uh, immediately and that a blogger will be in the room and tweet it out. Uh, and so I think that's put legislators, in a sense, on their toes. And I think for democracy, that's probably a good thing. What do you think, Lori? I tend to agree with Raj that it's a good thing, but what I've seen amongst the states is that many of them have state legislative channels. Did mm -hmm. Kansas have one? Uh, no, we don't. Georgia? Uh, they have, we have a nightly news dedicated to us, yes. Yeah. Okay, so... so a High lot viewership, of, I'm sure. <laughs> yes. So, for instance, in Connecticut, they have got a channel, the Connecticut uh, Network, which basically uh, runs video of their hearings and the mm. legislative process. Mm. So I think it's a great way to educate uh, the constituents and let them, and, and it's a window into seeing what's going on. But it also, I think, in particular instances, can mm. sway the way people are voting and, and the reactions of the legislators. So I, I think it goes both ways. Well, that's going to do it for us on this particular show. I want to thank Lori Kalani for being with us today. My pleasure. And thank you, Raj Goyle, you. for the AHOA educational experience. This is Chip Rogers. Be with us again next week.